All right, everybody, thank you all for coming out. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands once. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands twice. All righties. So hello, everybody. My name is Todd Chirazis, and I'm the founder and executive director of the AILA community. I've been doing this for about seven years. Thank you. Um, and so welcome to the first of a series of events that we're doing with FYI. Um, hopefully, everyone has downloaded the app. If not, please do so. This is supposed to be an interactive experience where we're going to be using the app not only to follow along with the pres all the presenters, uh, get their decks, get their presentations, get their you know, show notes, but also as a way for you guys to meet each other, have a discussion, and then also when we do the Q&A at the very end, you'll be using the app to relay information to our moderator to do the question and answer. So please download the app. It's on Apple Store and on Android, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So um, obviously we're in FYI's campus right now. There have been a very generous host. Besides that, if you see there's two monitors in front of you. These monitors are hosting an AI. So right now actually an AI is listening to my voice and all the voices that come out of these, uh, basically anything out of the microphone. So don't worry, there's no hidden mics in the crowd. It's all about capturing the content coming from our speakers. And you'll see it transcribing information up here. And we got our amazing Lawrence, who's going to give you a little bit more information about what Easy AI is. Let's give it for Lawrence. How's everybody doing tonight? Are we pumped? Enough alcohol in the system? Oh, let me not trip there. So guys, uh, AI is obviously taking over the world. Who agrees with me? Raise your hand. Yes. So like they say, if you can't beat them, join them. So that's why here. And Easy AI is a company that I started that allows you to hyper-tune an AI based on your business. So if you have a Google Drive, YouTube channel, if you're, on, if you're an influencer, you can literally in two minutes load that information in and it's going to transcribe it and hyper-train an AI model. And every event that we do with AI LA is actually getting hyper-trained and that AI model is going to be hosted on joinai.la so you can interact with it. So obviously the future is changing very quickly. And I like to say ChatGPT is awesome, but it's kind of like generic Motrin, right? So it doesn't know everything about you. You sometimes need that antibiotic. So if you need that antibiotic for your business, hit us up at Easy AI. We're right now raising capital. I put about a quarter million of my own money to the company. I'm looking for talent, amazing people. I'm gonna be right over there. So join me if you guys wanna discuss more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And then uh, Javon, one of our other amazing sponsors and partners is AE Studio. Right now, they're actually doing a full revamp of our website, and so we're very looking forward to when that website will launch very shortly. But here is Javon. Thanks, Todd. Good to be here. I'm curious, how many creators in the house? Hands? Are you scared or are you excited? So we're AE Studio, we're focused on increasing human agency through technology. And the way we look at this whole AI thing that's happening right now is it's a, it's a tool for us to be better humans, for us to create uh, better content, for us to make more money. Who here likes to make more money? That was not the uh, response I thought I was going to get. Uh, so yeah, so we're out in Venice. We're a team of about 170 uh, data scientists, developers, and designers. We build for clients. Uh, we build our own stuff. We have something called Same Day Skunk Works. You should check it out. We're launching products every single day. So we're super inspired by the entire AI tool set. And Todd, thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, find me in the crowd. Would love to talk about your project, what you're building, and hope we have some fun tonight. Thanks. All right, now before we get into our amazing panel discussion, I wanted to introduce you to a special person that helped make this all happen tonight, um, Mr. Will I Am. This is uh, his space, uh, the app that you guys are using to engage with us. Let's give it up for Will. <laughs> Will's gonna kick it off for us, and then uh, we're gonna get into a panel, this, actually we're gonna get into some lightning talks that will then go into a panel discussion, and so my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Will I Am. What's up, everybody? Um, thank you, Julie Pilot, for uh, pioneering this and championing us working with this awesome 
um, group of folks um, on one of the most important subjects of our lives right now, this intersection that we're in with artificial intelligence, how it's going to transform how we create, how we collaborate, how we do everything from legal, finance, um, storytell, educate, tutor, mentor. We are in the beginning of a new renaissance. And as we go out there and, and adopt these tools, I just want to remind everybody what creativity is. Creativity is not just songs and storytelling. Creativity is solving problems, you know? Um, and the, it's a big problem that's going to smack us in the face in this decade. The amount of jobs that are going to be obliterated, yesterday being undone. Um, and as scary as that sounds, if you're a true creative, you run at that. You run at that to solve the problem of jobs being obliterated and create new jobs. You solve the problem with tomorrow being, yesterday being undone and do tomorrow differently with these tools. Educating our nieces, our nephews, our daughters, our sons, the kids, the people that we care about to get involved in algorithm writing, data training, model building. This is a brand new age. Um, I started FYI back in 2020. We've been building the architecture of um, a Web 3.0 messenger with generative AI in the core. Uh, the version that's on the App Store now does not have the generative AI. We launched that in two weeks. Um, we issue elliptical curve cryptography keys to every single user on the platform. If you remember during COVID, the importance of elliptical curve or encryption keys. That shouldn't just be for NFTs. That should be for your conversations and your digital assets. Everything. Your data is your identity. And it's a human right that it's protected and owned by you. And so in this new era, remember what we are supposed to do as creatives, and that is to solve problems um, and collaborate. And this tool, as awesome as it is, um, Fingers crossed that the folks that are ushering in these regulations and governance around this transformational tool does it before shit gets that shit crazy. So let's have an awesome discussion. It's an awesome time. Thank you so much. Let's go. All right. Now, first, first up, we're going to have X. Give a presentation, and so um, presentation. yeah, presentation. A quick. Go. Wow! First of all, I just want to say shout out to Will, shout out to Todd for putting this together, and shout out to every single person in this room who's here today to learn, to actively receive this future, and be an active shaper of it. Okay, so I have to not be antisocial. <laughs> All right, hello everyone, my name is X. Yes, just the letter. If it's hard for you to pronounce, that's not my problem. Um, I work at, in artificial intelligence. I've been in this space for the last four or five years. Uh, I was previously at Microsoft where I worked at the intersection of blockchain, artificial intelligence, and IoT, or the Internet of Things. For about the last four years, I've worked at Google in responsible AI, making sure that the algorithms we create augment our world instead of um, effing it up, if you will. Is the slides up? Okay, you can go ahead and switch. Pretty good. Do a little dance. It's all good. The slide deck doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Hello, this is me, X. Yes, just the letter. This is where all of you can find me at on social media. So um, my favorite thing that I've built at Google since being there was not how we helped YouTube help creators, was not uh, the work that I did across uh, Google's search algorithms to make the image search results more diverse. It was the fact that I created Google's skin tone research team, which 
was intentionally about how do we make all of these computer vision algorithms actually see black and brown people. And the research team that we created in 2020 after George Floyd's death was successful in taking a step forward, not the final step, but a step forward in that research. We were able to turn that research on inside of Google Pixel. So if you ever saw the Super Bowl commercial or the big push that they did around real tone, real tone, we can see you now. Well, dang, that was an idea in my living room one day that became an active reality uh, about a year later. So that's my favorite thing that I created at Google. We taught AI how to see black and brown people. So artificial intelligence in the way that I think about it in non-technical terms is teaching AI how to think and act like humans. So right now when you have computer vision, that's teaching AI how to see the same way humans can see. Um, when you have NLP or natural language processing, so speech and hearing, your Siri, chat GPT, that's another field. So what is this creative generative AI space? Well, that's all about imagination. Teaching machines how to imagine a new reality around us. And I think of that across three eyes. The first is to help you as a person generate new ideas. Sometimes as creative people, we be tired. You know what I mean? If I ain't ate, I get, I get hangry. I'm not trying to think about what I need to generate or a good name. Or I have friends who are artists in, in different industries. I myself am a film producer. So it's like, man, I don't want to think about the next thing I have to generate. So AI can be an augmenter to the way in which you create ideas. AI can also be a... Oh, augmenter for how you iterate on your ideas. So with mid-journey, maybe you have a design that you like, but you want to see it slightly different without having to iterate on it. You can do that. AI can also help you invent new things. So if there are problems, like Will said, that we don't know the solution to, it could be a thought partner in helping us move that forward. So I'm really excited today to be able to share my wisdom with you, to be able to learn from all of you as well. And I hope that together we can shape a future with this technology that is welcoming and safe for all of us. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Wow, I love this crowd. I also love this stage. This stage is like comically tall. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to hit the ceiling. All right. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Bei Yang. Uh, I spent most of my life uh, teaching people how to pronounce my name, and now I spend most of my time convincing them that I'm not hitting on them. Uh, I spent 15 years of my career at Walt Disney Imagineering before moving on to Meta. Uh, and before moving on to Meta, I was the vice president of tech uh, at Imagineering, so that's all of the theme park rides, that's all of the theme park robots, but actually one of the things that I'm most proud of is actually this thing. Have anybody been on the Spider-Man ride in Disneyland? Yes? Okay, one person. <laughs> but, uh, but in that ride, you actually get to like sling webs out at this like virtual screen. That is actually the first instance in a Disney park that is run by AI, because we detect these things. And believe it or not, that idea started in 2008, but we couldn't do it at the time because machine learning and computer vision just wasn't there yet. More recently, uh, Star Wars Land also uh, launched, and one of the things I'm most proud of there is actually we made, it's, it's often called as a Star Wars hotel. It's actually called the Galactic Star Cruiser, uh, if you guys ever get a chance, go check it out. Who here knows what LARPing is? LARPing? LARPing? Live action role playing? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little nerdy, but imagine that for Star Wars for like three days straight, and that is what the Galactic Star Cruiser is, but you have a virtual concierge droid in your room, and that is entirely also powered by AI, but it is not like Siri or Alexa. It's like, hey, go you know, fetch me some room service. This one actually is part of the storytelling. Like, are you part of the resistance? Are you a spy for the First Order? Well, actually, you get to interact with her and, 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 and work with her. Uh, more recently, I moved over to Meta to uh, join the, um, the uh, Reality Labs group where we work on you know, bringing the metaverse into reality. 
AI is a foundational piece of that. I can kind of talk about what I'm doing there, but that's going to get really nerdy really fast. So instead, I'm going to spend some time to talk about how I like to think about AI. Uh, and one of the first things that I want to get out of everybody's head is, and you know, you guys can yell at me later, is this idea of human exceptionalism. Uh, I know this is somewhat controversial, and this is going to be filled with sweeping generalizations, but right now, the entirety of the human brain, all of our experiences, all of our memories, all of our creativity, is based on experiences that we have on the hardware that we have. And that hardware is made up of synapses and neurons. Neurons are just cells, and those synapses are the connections. And right now, it's a little bit hard to count, but it's estimated at around 60 to 600 trillion synapses in the human brain. Right now, a neural network is almost exactly the same thing. These little nodes are the neurons, these connections and edges are the synapses, and GPT-4, which is, if you get the pro version of chat GPT is running on GPT-4, right now has about a trillion parameters. Uh, parameters is not the exact same thing as synapses, but it's a pretty even match. Uh, and right now, we're actually not that far away from it. Like, to get from one trillion to 60 trillion is probably just on the order of like half a decade, if not less. So in terms of just the hardware alone, we are getting really close to there. Um, but the one thing that you know, I want to kind of just really kind of talk about this is like, okay, what is AI right now? Basically, you set up a network. This is really simplified. You just set up a network, and you just show it a bunch of data, and then you, and then you like tell if it's right or not, and then you just keep rinsing and repeating, and that's like, most of AI today in terms of deep neural networks. But actually now we also have AIs that train AI, so that's what adversarial neural networks are. But what this has kind of allowed it to do is to go much, much faster. Which brings me to this question, which is, does AI actually understand? Because one of the other things when I talk to people, it's like, oh, it's just a statistical machine. And that is kind of true, but in the same way that we are kind of statistical machines, AIs can be as well. So large language models, does it understand numbers? Actually, probably not. You can go try this right now. Ask ChatGPT uh, which one's more northerly, London or Mexico City? 50% of the times it'll get it right, 50% of the times it'll get it wrong. It's just hallucinating an answer. But if you ask it questions about grammar, about English, about language, it will nail that shit. Uh, in the same way, Image generation, image generation just generates something plausible, right? Like, if you take a look at this image, I actually love this because it's like kind of a hand, but kind of like two hands, it's like kind of weird. It's plausible. It understands 2D images, but it does not understand what a hand is. It doesn't understand what a page or a finger is. However, here's another one. This is a brand new field of study called neural radiance fields. Uh, which is you show it a bunch of pictures of an object, you throw it into a neural network, and out comes basically any, you can basically say like, okay, I have these angles, now show it to me from this novel angle, and I'll just be like, yeah, here it is. This one understands 3D space. Now the really interesting thing that will happen in the next couple of years that I'm actually very excited about, and also somewhat terrified by, is when these models combine. Because this one understands 3D space, this one understands 2D space, this one understands language, and when these things come together, they form something that's similar to what we do, which is we have representations of mental models in our minds, and they are going to connect, and we will eventually get to, and we were very, very close to something that I would define as general intelligence, which you know, is just what the AI and the science fiction uh, tends to be. So I'm both terrified and excited about that. So in the next decade, uh, what does creativity mean? Does anybody know, just by show of hands, who knows where this is from? All right, I've got some Disney fans in here, okay. <laughs> uh, everybody heard the word centaurs here, yeah? Centaurs? So, so this is actually what's used in the AI community today to say, okay, in the next decade, the most successful people are gonna be centaurs, which is human, AI hybrids in that the humans that are gonna be the most successful are the ones that's gonna be able to leverage and train AI. And then the other one is the thing that I'm also very curious about is what happens. Is like, does everybody know what an Ouroboros is? The snake eating itself? So if you think about the economy today, uh, it is driven by us putting content out there. And that drives the economy. That drives the internet. 
get ad dollars, we get you know, subscribers and all this stuff. Okay, AI is powered by that. And that means if AI is powered by that and now everybody's asking the AI and the content generators aren't generating anything anymore, what happens to the AI? So that's just the snake eating itself. So that call to action that Will I Am uh, put out there for everybody in here, I cannot agree with that more. And it's up to us, it's up to all of us to make sure that that snake does not eat itself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Seth, and uh, I'm going to probably talk about AI the least, and probably about what I've done in my life um, uh, the most. But I wanted to give you context of where I've been, and, and uh, oh, this is going forward already. It may end up going, can I pause it? Okay, all right. So I just wanted to talk about like where I've been because then when we talk about where I'm at, it'll, maybe it'll make a little bit of sense. So my name's Seth, uh, I'm from uh, Chicago. I was born in 1972. I went to Lane Tech, I hung out at Medusa's, uh, Wax Tracks, Gramophone, Columbia College. Uh, graffiti writers, skateboarders, house heads, uh, those are my communities. And for me, it's always been culture and community. And so where we're going now, we have, uh, well, we have the ability to do these stream spans of IP that if you spent a weekend with some of these tools, you'd be able to put out your lore, your history, uh, uh, videos, uh, comic books, books, like, whole IP can be created in a, in a very short period of time. But culture and community for me has always been at the center of everything that I have done. Uh, music was a big part of my life and I was able to contribute to Chicago's house scene. This is a good friend of mine, his name is Diz. He's from Chicago. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles in 2011 to join a team to work on a project called Call of Duty XP. Uh, was in the, um, uh, what, where Spruce Goose is at, where Google's headquarters is at now, and they had just wrapped filming uh, World Trade Center. We produced an event called uh, Call of Duty XP. It was for the release of Modern Warfare 3. It was a, a, a real life activation that featured uh, Jeep activities that drove them up and down courses. We brought to life Scrapyard, which was a, a paintball map. Um, and we brought him to life and we celebrated what the time was the beginning of esports. Um, Fwiz, if you know him, uh, Ryan Wyatt was still a caster and he was casting with Mike Rufail, who owned uh, Envy. And at that time, there was no VCs, they didn't own any of the esports um, companies. And you can see them all probably liquidating at this point in time. But I was able to produce events for Activision, Blizzard. Um, E3, I did five of those, did the original Call of Duty championships that were in Los Angeles at first, and then they went global, um, and I had a great time. Gaming community was, um, was great for me here in Los Angeles, and I moved to Berlin. Berlin, I worked at Riot Games. I produced events, uh, Korea, Greece, uh, last one was in a, the Olympic basketball stadium in Athens. Um, this, I think, is in Rotterdam or Copenhagen. But this was, for me, community on steroids. I was producing some of the biggest events in the world for gamers globally, and they connected like nobody else. And for me, that was the greatest thing that I could have ever done. I mean, this is my life and my career. Incredible. A guy from Chicago gets to go to Rotterdam and meet some incredible people and produce something like that. That's fucking dope. I built a studio there in Berlin as well. Um, these are the pro teams. They regulated at that point in time. It was 10 million euro for the franchise spots. There was 10 teams. 
and it's a global league. If anybody has seen Worlds, it's one of the biggest esports events in the world, and and usually wins the Emmy for the best production of a production on the internet. Uh, uh, but again, it was all about community. You know, gaming and esports is really interesting because it had the same kind of tenets for me that hip hop had. It had casters, streamers, pro players. You could be gamers yourself, and then you had the cosplay. And this is the studio, and this is Athens. So since then, um, I have had an opportunity to consult uh, for projects and kind of take a bit of the experience production or the experience producer that I, that I had been doing physically and kind of merge everything together with where we were going for, with, um, with COVID. And we took Blizzard from an online event to an online, uh, or a live event to an online event and then I started consulting brands in v virtual spaces and on, um, you know, uh, strategic partnerships. The last one I did was for the Kusama campaign that is happening now, or just wrapped, and that was with an agency out of London called Closer. I say all that because it gave me the opportunity to start something at the time that AI was kicking off. That was about August. For me, it was mid-journey was my thing. Skiva, if anybody is on LinkedIn, Skiva had dropped a disco diffusion video months before that. It was incredible, blew my mind. John Radoff was doing stuff with that as well. For some reason, the collabs, I couldn't fuck with because I always felt like I was messing with somebody else's folders. And that just became this barrier for me. But mid-journey came and it just blew everything off the rails. And so I was able to start a community, and that's what I did. I took all the bells and whistles that I did for other brands, and I, I stood up uh, five channels, I stood up uh, a Discord server, and I basically put myself full-time into this. Um, it was an incredible ride, but throughout that, throughout that time, we did what a community would do. We shared found resources. This is kind of like the Web3 you know, tenants that came around was that, you learned something and you shared it. It was valuable and you knew that it was gonna be something important for the future. Maybe yours, maybe somebody else's. You didn't hoard it because you wanted to be the only one that had it, you gave it away. And so that's what we started doing. We started hosting trainings, tutorials. We started sharing the resources, putting them in repositories for everybody could have them. Right now we are in, sorry, we're in I think 27 uh, countries. And we've got about 4,500 people on, uh, on LinkedIn, maybe 2,500 people that are in Discord. Um, creative directors, uh, founders, uh, you know, incredible people that are all pushing the boundaries. This is Ray Barcom. Ray is actually a uh, veteran and uh, retired uh, or at home and out of work. And I'm just gonna flip through some of these. And I think I have a video, I don't know what happens when that plays. This is us, us, a bit freaky, and for me that was what was really interesting about this space, is it allowed everybody to have a voice. When this can sincerely stand next to this, or this, and we can create and we can visualize anything that we have and we're not held back because we don't have expensive tools or expensive equipment. We're talking about global creators at our that are ignited and, and, and brought to life like never before on their mobile devices. So that's us, artificial intelligence, creative community. We did a, um, a, a campaign with uh, Brave Bison out of London and the World Wildlife Federation. And then I th think this wants to play if I press play, but I don't know how loud it's gonna be. This is a Kyber video. If anybody's used Kyber, Kyber is an extraordinary uh, tool. I took a song, you'll know the song. I put it in, I gave it a text prompt. The text prompt had something to do with trains, hip hop, 1990s, and then if this plays, it plays. It doesn't. Can you press play on that? It won't. Oh, that's too bad. 
Excellent. Uh, take a look at the video. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Rodenhaus. I'm professor at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Um, I don't know if we have any alumni here. Or I know I saw some students, too, are here. Um, and I also direct the Immersion Lab at Art Center College of Design. Um, this is a space that we created about seven or eight years ago. And its main purpose was to um, give access to all students equal access to emerging technologies. And I think we can all acknowledge prototyping or learning emerging tech doesn't come cheap. Um, so um, that was the mission of the lab itself, is to help students engage hands-on directly with emerging technology. Um, a little bit about myself is a lot of the learnings and workflows that we use within the lab is something that I uh, worked on when I was at uh, Microsoft Research and at Xbox. Um, so I wanted to share with you a method that we have um, really focused on developing the last eight years. It's something we call technology-centered research, um, where as artists and designers, our mediums are really important. I'm sure all of you can acknowledge that. So uh, typically and historically, we often think about like, working in the wood shop, or if you want to build something in metal, you need to know what it can and cannot do. And we saw this huge gap in terms of emerging mediums. So how can artists and designers uh, learn to prototype or work with new emerging software and hardware? Um, so what technology-centered research really does is we front the first month of a course and really think about what are the opportunities within this medium, so what are the attributes, what can and can it not do well, um, and then how do you work from that. So this is an example of one uh, project a student did uh, using an early form of deepfake software, so it already looks pretty old, but it was, so it was about like seven years ago he used this version. Um, and his insight was a really good deep fake data set is you open and close your mouth a lot and rotate your head. And so he had this idea of a really great karaoke bar would generate also deep fakes at the same time. So this is a graphic designer coming up with a business opportunity and also an entire brand, but coming from learning about deep fakes and training one himself. And something that I really like to talk about with students when they're first learning about what is artificial intelligence and machine learning is just how does it see or how are we programming a perception? Um, and it, it really comes back down to the fundamentals that we teach at Art Center, which is what is the line weight? What is the value? What is the shape? What is the color? And how is that informing your viewer on what you want them to see? What do you want to tell them through that color that you're choosing? Um, so we like to reinforce that that doesn't go away once we talk about machine learning. If anything, you're uh, scaling up that perceptual model or scaling up what you want them to pay attention to. Um, so we often show this image here of right, um, a machine learning model understanding a particular image through just pixel patterns. So what is that pattern you want to train a model upon? And still, the semiotics of just line, color, shape are still at play. So it's a way in which to connect what is like early, what is learned early within an artist's or designer's career at school to advance emerging mediums. And this is an example of a student's data set. We work a lot within data sets to talk about that's how you really own or train or craft a machine learning model. So this is a student doing collecting eye tracking data as a way to scale up a point of view or a vision. So that's something where we're always really interested in the lab is that like, 
oh, what is it to program a point of view or how somebody perceives the world, and that you can really individualize that. And then I think another huge aspect as uh, creatives is that we challenge existing models. And so this is another example of a student's project where they were looking at um, computer vision models and the fact that, okay, if you can train it on a bird, you can train it to recognize different birds, but equally you can train it now to individualize a bird. So what is it, how does that change our mental model in, in terms of how we organize information spaces, especially once they move more spatial? Um, so I just wanted to share a few projects that we are really particularly excited about in the lab and things that the students learned from really fo focusing on how do you train a machine learning model on their own. So thank you. All right, next up is our, our panel discussion with uh, Rachel Joy Victor as our moderator. Great. No worries. I'll All right, we have a great crowd here today. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and also thank you to our lovely group of panelists. Um, I hope everyone is ex as excited as I am after hearing a little peek into kind of a, a range of facets, I think, of where AI fits within the creative process. We good? Okay. Um, so for a little bit, bit of background on me, I'm Rachel Joy Victor. I work as a strategist, designer, and world builder. My background is in computational neuroscience and spatial economics, so that's informed the data, the process with which I think about data and world building and building worlds at the center of responsive experiences. So I recently came back from NAB. Um, we were talking about world building, we were talking about worlds at the center, but there was a really interesting point made in one of the panels where we were talking about virtual production and this idea of you know, having a world-centric approach to creating content. And someone made a really good point. They said, um, with virtual production, we're no longer capturing images, we're capturing data, which is a whole new way you know, of thinking about the production model, of thinking about the creative process because you're capturing the set of information. You can change the parameters of that set of information at different points of the process. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of an interesting snapshot that's one specific industry, that's one specific creative process, but I think it's linked to a little bit of what we've heard today so far, this idea that the creative process, the creative pipeline is changing a little bit in terms of how we work with and alongside AI. Um, so I'm curious as like a starting point maybe for us to start this discussion, um, what are some differences you've seen in AI being this tool now in the creative process, or Jenny, you talked about AI being maybe the medium of, of creation. Um, what has is, what is evolved now in, in the processes that you've seen working with AI? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll jump in. Uh, the first thought is I think the kind of realization that we have of talking about like minimum maybe 500 images to curating. No, a good data set is beyond 5,000 or way more. Just men of working with students creating their own model. And that's just like an interesting discussion in terms of like that's not their expectation coming in, that it's about curating a really good data set. And then equally what follows that is what is the pattern that you want to amplify? Because a very generalized data set becomes, you, the outcome is like, eh, not as concise. Or it's like, what are you trying to get out of this model? And I think that's the real iteration that occurs through the creative process is getting more refined around and how hard that is to amplify a single pattern. But that's, again, an individual working on their own model. But that was the first kind of thought I had. Yeah. yeah. 
So in, in, in training data um, is interesting. Just to take it into the, the, the visual realm of things. I was able to witness from two Ubisoft uh, technical creatives. I saw them reverse engineer the zero to concept pipeline and wipe out weeks worth of work and reduce it down to hours after the data set was trained. They trained the stable diffusion model uh, on the style of work that they wanted to receive, the um, brush strokes, the camera, the film, the patina, the style of gene that you want. Take any brand that you want. Gucci's next campaign, the next movie that you're gonna film. Why not have a God box that has been trained on your own data set that when you go to location or you have somebody doing costume designs, they can immediately whip out something that has the face of the actor already baked into it. So you can actually see this in real time. Um, so I saw these two guys, they, they, they walked me through it. My mind was blown away. And then we trained a bunch of people in the community on how to do it themselves. Um, but this was taking a 768 by 768 image and up it to 8K through means and resources and tools, but it's all available. I mean, these are things that, and th the reason why for me, I, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm here is because I saw that these tools were going to change the world and they were incredible and they blew my mind and I couldn't put it down and I wanted to do something about it. Jeremy, thoughts Yeah, sure. Oh, wow, this is very loud. Okay. Um, so I've worked on tools quite a lot uh, in my life. So uh, my previous job was like a huge part of the job was making tools for theme park designers. Um, one of the things that you kind of see is just this trend, and I'll talk about two trends. One is just the tools are going to get better and they're going to make humans faster. So way back when, there was not a, like Photoshop was not a thing, right? Who here uses Photoshop or something similar? Yeah, who uses something like Photoshop but just on your phone with like all the power? Yeah, like it's way more accessible now. A large part of that is just gonna be AI powered. Like, I don't know if there's any kind of like old school film editors that like you know, used to rotoscope and mask stuff out. Like, that's a pain in the ass. That is not a problem anymore. Like you could literally like just like two clicks, you're done today. And, that's, and that trend is gonna continue. So when I, talk about, uh, when I talk about centaurs, it's really like everybody's just gonna get faster. And what does that mean for all of you, all the creators? Does that mean that you're gonna be able to scale stuff out more? You're just gonna generate more content? Does that mean that you're gonna be able to spend more time iterating on content? I think that's for everybody here to figure out. The next one is, I think, much more revolutionary. So the second path is not about making people faster, but actually entirely different industries. I'll say one word, uh, and it's fairly nascent, and I'm sure you're gonna hear more of it probably in the next five years, which is virtual influencers, which is an entire AI-powered personality, and now all of a sudden you can have people that are behind it, AI driving it, AI creating content, and then essentially doing the writing, and now you can essentially have one person that's training a bunch of AIs, in which case you've gone up one level of abstraction, and now you've got a trainer of AI that's generating content, rather than AI helping a person generate content. So I think that's kind of the next uh, evolution of that, and then it's really about like, okay, what's value, and then it turns into this whole responsibility thing. Oh, the responsibility of it, that's what the question is. Um, this idea of virtual influencers or even like virtual assistants that are powered by AI falls into a category called uh, DHAS. So if you've ever heard of SaaS, software as a service, DHAS is digital humans as a service. And it, you're laughing, but it's what they're calling it. How can we create fake people and sell them? And I'm like, damn, the last time we did this with real people, it didn't work. What haven't we learned? <laughs> Right, um, but when we think about the way in which these workflows have changed, I think 
to you know Ben's point, technology has always augmented the way we work. Before there was a tractor, the way we would plow fields was very different. Before there was a car, the way that we would travel from place A to place B was very different. I think the thing that we really need to think about as creatives in different ways, whether the way that you create is your own art, an expression of yourself, whether the way that you create is those project files and plans for your job, that where we are right now is at an accelerated pace that we have not seen technology move ever before. And it's very easy to move in a fear-based space. Well, if there's digital influencers, what am I gonna do as an actual human influencer? Do I need a model? Do I need an NFT? What am I supposed to do? Versus, do we want digital influencers? Do we want people who do not look like me creating avatars that look like me? Is that the reality we wanna live in? Should there be a limit? And then if they take my images and make a digital avatar, should I be paid for it? How so? Because that's what we're running into with a lot of these creative algorithms. They were trained on art that was gathered from the public. And so to bring this into a more positive note, this is the moment in time where we get to say, I am not going to be a victim of this change that's coming technologically, but I'm intentionally going to be a shaper of it. A lot of us probably saw that Drake AI song with The Weeknd that went viral that I still slap every day. It was really good. And what did that do? That forced a conversation in the industry when art is created based on somebody else's influence from a human. So let's say I just listen to a bunch of Drake songs and I try to rap like Drake. No one's gonna come for me for copyright claims about Drake's music, right? But then when we make an AI that literally sounds like him, it's a problem. And so these conversations are happening right now at a legal level across almost every agency in the US. How do we regulate this technology? Do we regulate it? And so I think the question of how this technology will impact our processes falls as much on all of us as folks that are members of society as much as it does as the people building the algorithms. I think that's a great point and also a great setup for my next question. Um, after the, the news came out around the, the Drake stuff, the, the Drake songs went viral, there was um, Grimes respond on Twitter and, there, and propose that, you know, if there are songs that go viral that use my voice as a, as a training model, let's split profits. Let's move forward with this new model of like what it means to have maybe co-ownership of her voice and her artist, artistic expression. Um, but I, I have a question about that kind of also based off of what, off of what you were saying, Bay. this idea of, um, you know, we've always used tools as assistive, as assistive devices for creation. Um, there was a lot of controversy, even if we look like 10, 15 years ago around what happens when you have like digital cameras with auto settings or when we use Photoshop and all these tools that are shaping and changing the, the nature of what it means to create a photograph, right? Um, and now this is kind of that, but on a different level. Kind of at the intersection of both of these things, as a creator, as an artist, as I'm sure there are some people here, what does it mean to maybe create an artistic signature at this point when so much of this is going to be created maybe in collaboration with AI, in collaboration with synthetic input, in collaboration with you know the communal input, which some of what you're seeing in your context, Seth. So, so what, is, what does it mean to be an artist and maybe have an artistic voice? Well, don't look at me. <laughs> I, because you guys, you guys get to look at yourself through that process and reflect on yourself uh, is really what I mean. But I think what's interesting about the tools now is that if you are a creator, you have incredible things available to you that you have never been able to play with before in your process. And if you want to take those tools, you know, I mean, John Finger is a director. Uh, I, I follow his work. Um, he's doing the, you know, the, the, the uh, runway uh, three second uh, gen one, you know, um, posts like everybody was doing. It's like, oh, we slowed down on the post. Let's put some more betas out and then you get more posts. But he was taking the three second videos and he stitched them together. And he went labor intensively. Or, or if you've seen the Harry Potter or if you've seen the other Gucci and you've seen the Balenciaga. H&M, Balenciaga, H&M. But if you've seen those ones where they've done it with the AI, somebody is taking their time deliberately wants to accomplish a thing. And so they have to go through the process to get to the end result. And sometimes that's labor intensive, tedious. And so it really is about the individual and how they want to take the tools that are available. Yes, they're fast, but you can also slow down time and you can create remarkable stuff with tools 
you know, that we have today, we didn't have them today. We were using, you know, collages and stuff, but now you can do stuff that's different. So, I don't know, it's incredible what people are gonna be able to decide to do with them. Um, this is a topic I think about a lot. Like, there's not a lot of things that keep me up at night. This is actually one of them. <laughs> Which is like, what is technology bringing just from an, uh, from an economy? Look, there's a call to action here. There's a bunch of creators here. There's a bunch of creatives here. There's probably creative managers here. All of us are within a specific system. That system is how we think of society today, how we think of capitalism today. That is gonna drive AI. That is gonna drive AI exploration. That is gonna drive AI advancement. Uh, the attribution problem and the kind of legal bounds and the rules are going to be slower than how fast technology can move. And certainly the desire for humanity and capitalism driving humanity to change that. That very key part actually does keep me up at night because like, as I said before, in terms of just getting to 600 trillion neurons, like that's really close. That's, that's really close. I don't, uh, and when you get to that point, how do we make a world in which the value of art is still there? We're in LA. LA is the city that is built on the commercialization and the capitalization of creative and art. We have put value into it. But intrinsically, like, what is actually art? It's really a, ref it's really a person connecting with another person or a group of people. Uh, and to me, that's the thing that we always kind of have to come back to, which is that value is actually about human connection. And that is actually one thing that, frankly, uh, AI is never going to get to. Now, that's not to say that it won't make money and people will find connection there and you know, all the stuff that we're talking about with digital humans isn't going to be a thing. But I think the kind of North Star that everybody has to focus on is like, how do we maintain that human connection where there's still that value and then people can still survive, right? And that is going to require uh, a fairly massive shift in the way that we think about work, in the way that we think about productivity, in the way that we think about our reward system. Uh, and I'm not going to you know, paint a picture of sunshine and rainbows. This is gonna be hard. It's like really effing hard. I don't have a perfect solution for it, but I will say that like these conversations help because that allows you to think about it. And none of these things, I can tell you this right now, none of these things is gonna change by companies alone, like there has to be at some point rules and regulations put on to these things, which you know nobody likes to. It gets into a very boring topic very quickly, but uh, but like that has to be done at some point, and that's a thing that you know I think like we're going to need more of uh, in the future. If I can add on for just a second, I think something that we tend to forget when we define what art is right now is that for many people in this country in particular and around the world, imagination is a privilege, right? It's not something that people have outright that they're able to use and express because maybe they wanna paint but can't afford the painting supplies. Maybe they wanna draw but they have to go to work instead of being able to take an art class. Maybe they want to go and learn how to do video editing on Adobe Premiere but can't pay the $60 a month subscription. And that's a reality, maybe not for those of us in this room, but certainly for the people where I grew up. Uh, I'm a formerly incarcerated youth, a high school and a college dropout, so I come from a very different reality from the one I'm living in every day where Google makes meals three times a day and I get you know, the apple beet carrot juice on demand whenever I want it. And so I think as much as AI can be terrifying for creatives, I'm excited to see what gets created when, when the individuals who have not had a chance to make art can now do so at an accelerated pace because of these tools. Maybe there's a student out there who has an amazing idea, a kid in Ghana or a kid in Brazil, is an amazing idea for an animated film that will become just as classic as Little Mermaid. 
but can't make it because they don't have the tools, the production, the team, the connections, whatever. Well, now they could take their, their uh, mid-journey and then their runway ML and make a little sample of it and put it on YouTube and let's see where it goes. So I think with these tools, I'm hoping that we use them to unlock the privilege of being able to use and exercise our imagination to be able to create more art from diverse perspectives. Because another thing is that these AIs can only be taught on art that was already created. So there is a limitation to what is new that they can create. So I, I'm just really excited to see how we redefine artists by one, increasing the scope of who we consider an artist because the scope of who will be able to access creating art that may not have been able to before. The, the cost is actually a very interesting thing, is that we're talking about thousands of dollars for programs that now you can get for, for pennies. Yeah, uh, I like the point you brought up too around like what is the main purpose and I think it calls to focus on why do people get into this field to begin with, is that you fundamentally enjoy making something and sharing it with others. This tool does help you scale that up and I think that's a huge benefit. Um, but I don't think that the act of making will go away. Because that's like, I think about the parts that I would offset and the parts of my work I don't. I'm like, well, I'm not going to offset that, that component because that's what I enjoy during my day. And that's not going to disappear, I don't think, for any of us. Yeah, I think Jenny and Axe, you both touched on this a little bit, but this idea of are there pieces of the creative process that are different that we achieve as humans that are embodied, that have sensation, that interact with the physical world potentially? And they, I feel like you're gonna definitely have thoughts on this. Uh, coming from the neuroscience perspective, I think for me, I feel like there are things that are different between where artificial intelligence is now and the way it synthesizes input versus the way we process input in a very sensory forward way. But there, there is becoming more of a convergence in terms of AI has the ability to synthesize a great deal of input that, that we can't quite process. Um, but are you noticing kind of differences in terms of the way you think creatively with AI as a tool that's giving you um, kind of coming alongside the process, providing the synthesis versus when you're creating um, and maybe able to bring divergent thoughts together, which is a little bit more um, divergent versus the convergence of AI? I'll say maybe a controversial thing here, uh, which is that, you know, I, I already talked about human exceptionalism. Uh, AI is being creative, like in, in the definition of the word. Uh, it, it, it's using a different mechanism, but I would argue just like we have a collection of experiences and education that allow us to be creative, that allow us to synthesize and make novel things, that we have kind of these like bolts of inspiration, some of us, uh, in which it feels like something is coming on high and it's coming out. Uh, AI has very similar mechanisms, right? Like, and this whole, you know, thing of attribution, I actually also asked is like, does that mean that like, I have to go attribute my art teachers for all of the art I generate? Which by the way, I think, I think we should, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, that's, that's, that's like a, that's, that's like a real, that's like a real thing. But, one thing I want to uh, uh, I want to say about kind of like AI and experiencing it right now, it's AI isn't going to have a human experience because it's just not like we can show it different things that are representations of human experiences, but it's not. And you know we can also go down like the Terminator sci-fi route where there's robots. By the way, I've worked in robotics. We are very far away from that. We're not going to get into a Terminator thing anytime soon. It's just like physics is really hard. Wait, they were just they were just training those dogs from uh, Boston, Boston Robotics Dynamics. with yeah. ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. They got, I, those, seen they got those robots oh. doing parkour. I don't know how far you, away you we can are. do it, but those robots are real delicate. Like you, you would those not believe. Those things weigh four thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they only like their duty cycle's not that great. <laughs> all right, all right, but they're coming for us. <laughs> They're not coming, they're already here. <laughs> they're already here, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, just, just that like, our feeling is about connecting to each other. Like that's kind of what I said before about the kind of the value of art. So I think that's going to be a differentiator uh, in, in a lot of this and it will, it will continue to be. And hopefully, you know, whether or not uh, we kind of bridge that gap at some point, like that's gonna be kind of one of the high watermarks uh, for AI in the coming probably multiple decades.
I, I think what, what's interesting is that, so when AI came into the mix for me, it was on the, the, the back end of Web3. And, and then the, the dumpster fires started happening with all the shenanigans and stuff. But what's remarkable for me about Web3 was the new technology that was introduced into um, like ownership for a user and then this proposition that brands and then the end user were going to have more of a dialogue and conversation and it was going to be more personal. And you might see that now with what Artifact is doing with Nike, but when AI came into the mix, I was consulting on a project for a beauty brand that wanted to do digital representation, so avatars, so how you show up, how you decide to show up is for me what's really interesting about avatars. I got more business with a, um, I like you, you're weird PFP as my, my JPEG on LinkedIn than I did with my, my photo like this. And then that's just an AI, uh, you know, uh, generated one. But when it, when I was consulting on this project, it had to do with crafting and collecting. So you're collecting digital tokens. You know, Amazon is going to go ham with NFTs very soon. And it's going to be so ubiquitous that if you watch every one of their episodes, you're going to get these digital tokens, which is more interesting than the alpha stuff that played out where if you didn't have the super rich collections, then you didn't do so good in NFTs. But when AI came into the mix, it added the user-generated content piece that I needed to unlock what was happening with Web3. Blender, super cool, it's gonna be used, it's being used now to take PFPs, to rig them, to bring them to life, to bring them into uh, Hype, Fury, Hype, Hype Fury or Webiverse. And so it gave this ability for a user to really be able to touch and create something themselves. It wasn't able to do that before. But now you've got this great convergence. XR, Unreal Engine, uh, in-camera VFX, movie industry has changed the whole thing. AR is coming online. And we are all about to have experiences, again, like we have never seen before with AI and Web3 and blockchain technology. And as we're talking about these digital to physical experiences, that's going to become the new, that's the, that's the piece. And so all of these things are going to be connected and they're just going to blow this whole thing that we have going on away. I mean, you're bringing up AR, so I'm instantly thinking of computer vision in terms of, I think, reading more opportunities around that it can show us a, a point of view that we're not capable of physically. And I think that's where I remember HoloLens years ago came out with like, they can, it can view somebody's heartbeat and just determine based on like pixel, subtle pixel changes. And I think that's a huge opportunity where it, it is kind of pushing back and help influencing what we now have viewed or observed and now that we could share that even further. Um, so I think that's a huge opportunity of like connecting AR with, within this space. I think you, you started talking about this stuff, this convergence of AI with other creative fields that we're starting to see. And Bay, you talked about the Ouroboros, this idea of, of you know, the models feeding the models and kind of this, the cyclical um, act of creation. Some of those are, are more negative and some of those are more positive. What are the things that moving forward in the next five to 10 years are exciting you about where the space is gonna evolve? And before we get to answering those questions, if you all have questions, there's the FYI app, download it. If you, share, if you ask your questions within the discussion section, I can see it and I can ask it after, after the panelists answer this question. Can you repeat the question? Please. Sorry, Something. five to 10 years, what's <laughs> most exciting? I think two things that are most exciting for me is what does the world look like when everyone gets a more equal chance to participate in shaping it day to day? when you might not necessarily need an MBA from Harvard to create really good quality financial analysis or financial projections, who will get to play a role in creating the businesses that we see? Something else that really excites me because there's such a huge, huge opportunity to move this space forward is the data sets that we create and how we collectively decide how our data gets used. 
uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Alex Hanna, who used to be a, a researcher at, at, um, at Google Research, she's the first social science research scientist there, uh, she wrote a paper that showed that for all these major models that everyone's using, the data sets for those models come from 12 institutions around the world. 12. There's a lot more universities and a lot more perspectives and a lot more groups of people outside of the US, Canada, and Europe who can create and participate in shaping the way that these models are played out in our society. And right now, that's just not happening. Um, so I'm excited to see those two things. I'm also excited to see what we all, again, collectively decide is the change that we want to shape uh, instead of ending up victims of changes that are, are being pushed down our, our throats by various corporate entities. So that's what I'm excited for. Look, this is probably too optimistic. I'm excited to vote for like a four day work week and possibly even less because like just productivity has gone up. But you know, that's, that's, that's gonna require a lot of like pushing, but like, you know, more free time. It's, it's, it's kind of great. Um, I think the accessibility thing is, is huge uh, in terms of education, but not only intellectual education, but specifically emotional education. So one of my, like, Mr. Rogers, anybody a fan of Mr. Rogers? Yes, yes. Like, Mr. Rogers is awesome, but it's a show. What if I can have personalized emotional education for kids? That's actually, like, not that far away. Yes, it can be a little scary if it's done poorly. However, like, therapy is a thing especially at a young age, that actually can be scaled out so that it's more accessible, so that it doesn't have this cost barrier and we can actually just have like a society of like healthier people. And that education of both intellectual and emotional education is something that really what we're after is like scale. And that's something that technology is actually like really good at doing. So for me, it's actually like pushing humanity so that there's more access. I, I do want to emphasize the future of education. I've, I mean, I'm seeing the direct impact in the classroom with, I teach Unity quite a bit, and just being able to have students converse with chat GPT while I'm busy maybe working with another student, and they're learning from the conversation. But it's not saying it's eliminating my class whatsoever, because it's, it's actually reinforcing the terminology that we've introduced and the foundations there. Whether it's unity or the foundations of how to draw, you still need to understand that language and also consider what are you trying to do with this? What do you want to do with the tool? And that, that kind of goal just becomes more in, intensified through the use of any of these um, chat or automation like tools that we're discussing. Accessible, personalized education is actually a lot closer than I think we, 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 we talk about. It's, it's really close. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward, I mean, it's not five, it's five years. <laughs> it's, it's Tuesday. There's a couple of other technologies that are gonna be dropped. I think Thursday, there's a couple of big announcements. I have no idea what, but you guys let me know when it hits your, your feed. Um, I'm looking forward to when these tools that are available now, as they start to become a part of the creative process, because we talked about them. They are tools, and we are now just able to discover them, or a, a section of people are because others have had these tools available to them. But we're going to start seeing media created in new ways, shown in new ways, presented in new ways, experience touched, and then interacted with in new ways. And that's gonna be across everything, across your ownership, your brand experiences. If you've seen the hyper-reality video on, on YouTube, um, it's totally gonna be like that. It's going to be the sim Simulacra? I don't know how to say it. Yes. Um, and it's going to be incredible until you want to turn it off and go take a walk. But while we're here, let's touch the tools that are shaping our future and find out what we can do with them. I think one of the things that, that comes up when we talk about AI and education is that AI then isn't just about output and about you know, our co-creation, but about AI being used as a tool to understand intent, right? 
intent recognition, understanding ourselves better, um, AI as a tool to, if we're thinking about extended intelligence, there's always the need to understand where that connection point is, right? Um, but I think there's a concern that arises from that. And I'm gonna like pull a question that came from the app through Cynthia. Um, if we want to be able to have that, mo that mode of extended intelligence that draws from how we operate and how our bodies operate, that also involves representation of data that's broad enough, of a broad enough subset. And Cynthia, Cynthia asks the question, if our current prominent modes of visuality still lean away from the representation of black and brown bodies, how can we as creators of color gain a foothold in programming perceptions for AI models? So, <laughs> here's my theory. I'm too lazy to go build this out. I have other things that I'm working on that are more close to my heart. Uh, I'll give you guys a little example of how hard it is to get inclusive data sets from within a company. So when you're training, like, let's say, uh, a computer vision model, so you want to teach a camera how to see people of all skin tones, like a phone camera, or maybe even just a camera and a laptop. Someone wants to get on video chat, I want to know that they're there. I want to do person recognition. You need a data set that has a sample representation of everyone who might buy that computer, close up to it, far away from it, to the side, to this side, with the hat on, with the hat off, with the jacket on, in a light shirt, in a dark shirt, because in order for the computer to replicate the behavior of humans, which is we could look and see that a person's there, you have to give it enough diverse samples of humans to understand and see across the variation in our own variation as people. So meaning like you might need the same person with different hairstyles like me with my hair down and with my hair up and like three years ago and I was going through it and I dyed my hair blonde and like, you know, that way it can know it's still a person in the room. So there was a point where we were like, yo, we need a data set like this. We want maybe like around the globe, three, 4,000 people to go and like we just need videos of them every day for like six months, a minute video, whatever device they have is fine. And the vendor was like, okay, we can get that for you if you give us $30 million. $30 million for videos, a minute video that people are giving away for free on TikTok. That was insane. And so you know what the business said? Because to base point, they have a fiduciary duty to make money. Oh, no, we're not doing that. That's too much money. That's not going to return a big enough investment for us. So as creators of color or people of color, taking autonomy back over those data sets, creating them in the way in which the companies need and licensing to them at equitable points where you give that money back to the people who contributed their data. So if you get your cousins and your auntie and your mama and your friends to go and take a video every day for a year, you might not make 30 million, but you could very easily make 10, 20 million dollars licensing those data sets out. License it once to this company, then to that company, then to the next company. And there's an entire business model that's not being tapped um, outside of like on-demand requests that are too expensive and businesses will shy away from it. So I think it's, it's again, are we going to be victims of what companies are already willing and not willing to do? Or are we going to intentionally shape that future by taking the charge and like Will said at the beginning, it's a problem, how are we going to solve it? So I think that's where I'll pause there because I could go on all day about this. I do think creating your own models, that's just a huge part of it. That, that gives you the ultimate control. Because anything of mid-journey is just taking from what's already free and already been given to the internet. And so it's, again, not making anything potentially new. And so I think in order to have a new vision, we need people to own the entire stack on their own. Yeah, I'll say this is what I meant by capitalism and the system matching kind of business and what the social desires are. And that requires a voice and that requires rules and that requires understanding. Uh, I don't think that maybe our legislators have the best understanding right now. Maybe that's an understatement. Uh, but I think we have, to, we have to get there. And I think that that's work that, uh, that, that people, actually I and a couple friends are actually pushing for. Um, because really, look, just for everybody to think about it, at least this is the way I think about it, companies are always after only two things. It's speed and money. <laughs> speed and money. Uh, it is good business to have representation because that means that you can have a wider market. But, it means, but if I can get a little bit of the market, 
much faster, a lot of companies will choose the faster route. Uh, so really, it is about setting up a system in which that market and that drive becomes collinear. Uh, but you know, that's much harder said uh, than, much, much easier said than, than done. Yeah, I think that's partly a two-way issue, right? Not just represent, not just representation within the data sets that inform this type of behavior, but also um, representation and, and ability to have attribution um, then in the creation of things that are based on our culture uh, or based on our ethnicity. Um, I don't know if people have followed the news from Levi's, which on, on the one hand, great move towards representation and having more diverse models but those diverse models are digital humans. Going back to the digital humans as a service. They brought out the DHAS instead of just paying actual black people. We don't like Levi's no more. Right, so I think that's, that's kind of a thing we circle back to, which is this question of how can we as creators, how can we be a part of this conversation because attribution is so fundamentally kind of related to so many of these issues that we're talking about. Um, and there's a question that we have from the audience um, I think it was Jules asked, what roles can creatives play in shaping cybersecurity and protecting individuals' data, like intellectual property? How can we be a part of the conversation beyond just being concerned about it? I mean, I think make work about it. I think that's like everything that artists and designers have done throughout time is if you see something you want to express, either you, your dislike or agreement, whatever you make work, let it foster and fuel that because um, I feel like that's how we speak in general is through form and through making um, but I, I would say like creating alternative models to show you know what what is the problem with that and calling them out I think is important blow up your politicians use chat GPT to write letters we need regulation we need it badly and we need to be active shapers in that regulation. Um, I can give a bunch of non-creative examples of the way AI is actively harming people. Like right now in 12 different states in the US, uh, algorithms are being used to, in the CPS system, Child Protective Services, to decide whether or not kids should be separated from their parents. And those algorithms were kicked out of the state of Illinois because they were shown to be bad and biased towards black and brown people. So they're sep we're using machines to like make decisions that we shouldn't. So even outside of the creative discussion of like, should it be copyrighted? Should it not? How's that different from me learning from my art teacher than me learning from like listening to Drake songs, right? There's a real tangible impact that's happening that a lot of us have for many reasons had our head in the sand. And we have a responsibility to make sure that moving forward, it is shaped intentionally. So the first is that the White House is creating a uh, AI regulation act. They've opened it up for public comment many, many times. If you haven't commented, go find it, go comment. The second is the US House has the American Data Privacy Protection Act, uh, where they are proposing that companies should be held accountable if their online services are found to be biased in alignment with the federal civil rights laws, which are all protected groups that we care about. That needs to pass. Um, even if you are not worried about federal regulation, at a city and state level, there are laws that are being passed in a lot of different places. I know that the city of Berkeley, California, shout out if anyone went to UC Berkeley, go Bears. Go Bears, go Bears, I didn't finish, but go Bears. Um, they ban, for example, facial recognition uh, you know, in body cameras. They still require body cameras, but they can't be trying to identify suspects with it. So now the city of Berkeley operates the way those people have shaped. So you don't always have to go to the biggest level to be shaping things that are impactful. Call your city council members, call your mayor, call your state representatives, and make sure that you're intentionally playing a role because the truth is, in 20, 30, 40 years, when we're all the old people in this room or no longer here, and it's like my nieces and nephews on this panel, am I gonna be able to look them in the face and say, I did everything I could to leave you a good foundation? Or am I gonna say, well, you know, I would have commented, but I was too busy on TikTok scrolling to go and send in my comment to the FCC or to the White House, right? So these things are not massive amounts of your time. They just have to be intentional. So I implore everyone in the room to take a more active role in the conversations that are already happening, even if you're not aware, and to make yourself, you know, your information flow be so that you can be aware, so you don't have to wait till you come to another AI LA panel to figure out what's going on, although you all should come back still.
Any thoughts from that end? Get educated, get organized, be loud. Keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, make some visual noise, make some sonic noise, make some fucking noise and let your voice be heard. Great. I think it's a constant process of education because also the technology is continuing to evolve, continuing to change. Um, there's a project out of U Chicago um, that was done um, with collaboration with artists and researchers um, to develop basically a layer for images that artists uploaded online so that it couldn't really be fed into training algorithms without messing, messing up the image and what actually kind of came out of the output. And something interesting, if you go and check out the project, they acknowledge, hey, this is going to be effective for like maybe a couple of weeks, right? This isn't necessarily going to be a permanent solution. But I think it's a process of kind of developing temporary solutions while we have this broader conversation of moving, moving change forward um, and also um, creating space for ourselves to learn and, and not as, as art becomes more interrelated with technology, I think having more conversations where creators and artists are coming together with technologists and more of a space for these types of conversations to happen. So subscribe to the AI LA newsletter so you can keep coming back to these conversations as we have them collectively. Yep. Thank you all for joining and coming with us today. Um, and thank you to this great panel.